Hello and uh, welcome to this discussion of the week seven reading for Lit 101. Um, uh, this week we're exploring uh, the theme of what is, beginning to explore, explore the theme of what is wrong with us. And uh, two classic texts in Western civilization literature, uh, of course, Genesis 3, and then one of the, one of the, if not the greatest uh, literary depiction of Genesis 3 in Milton's Paradise Lost. Um, uh, Dr. Myers. It is the greatest one. Oh, yeah, of okay. course it is. Well, this Don't is let there be any doubt. This is what it. I was going to say. I was going to move this a tiny bit. Uh, Dr. Myers, you are a Milton scholar. Mm -hmm. And so this work uh, is of, is, is a great passion of yours. Did you want to introduce the, the text for us? Uh, explain maybe a bit about who John Milton is or was um, and uh, what 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 the text is about, what is Milton trying to achieve, and also like what is the significance of of, of Paradise Lost in Western culture and in Western literature? Mm. That's a lot of questions, but I'll try. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me say something about about the work itself. Milton uh, was a 17th century Puritan, uh, so one of the more radical nonconformist Protestants in 17th century England. He was known mostly during his lifetime as a political um, thinker and a political pamphleteer. He wrote usually short, explosive texts on highly controversial topics, especially during the period of the English Revolution, when the monarchy was overturned, Oliver Cromwell came in with his army and they began to set up an entirely new mm. social order. It was a period in which it felt as if all the older social norms were disappearing. We're talking 1640 to 1660. Yeah, basically. the 1640s yeah. in particular was when it was as if everything was up for grabs. Mm. We dissolved, they literally cut the head off their monarch. Mm. They dissolved the existing social order. And it was it was in that period that Milton emerged. He was, he was already a well-known um, figure in English intellectual life before that point. Um, but he emerged as one of the most radical voices calling for a new England that would carry out and complete the great task of reformation that had begun a century earlier. Um, Milton's, Milton's views were highly controversial on many topics. He argued um, for the freedom of the press uh, meaning that books should not be censored for their opinions, but we should be allowed to, uh, at a time when censorship was a normal part of daily life, he argued that heresy mm -hmm. was an important component of public discussion. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't just hear the right views, we should hear the wrong ones too. And after all, who are we to decide in advance? Mm -hmm. What are the right and wrong views if we're suppressing some opinions? So he argued for what we might call freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Um, long before that became a fashionable mm. idea, he argued for the total reform and essentially rebuilding of marriage and divorce laws in England, arguing that married couples should be allowed to divorce one another on the basis of um, intellectual incompatibility. Mm. If they can't have a decent conversation mm -hmm. together, mm. they should just shake hands and agree to mm. part ways. And at a time when marriage and divorce were very, very heavily controlled mm. by the church, Milton argued that the church should actually have nothing to do with this. This is mm. between the conscience of individuals. Um, he argued, uh, he, he proposed reforms in education and um, reforms in the way the church was structured and the church was governed. He wrote an alternative history of England, mm. showing the trajectory of in England. All, like all along, England has been destined for this moment of glorious freedom and so on. Mm. So Milton's, the defining period of his life was as a leading revolutionary figure during a period of very, very significant social yeah. breakdown and social rebuilding. He'd be described as a, a quite like a radical Republican, politically speaking, and he was a supporter of the Cromwellian regime. Yeah, he worked for them. He, he, wor he, he worked, worked for Cromwell. Yeah, that's right. He like spent himself basically working for mm. Cromwell. And his, and the, I guess to emphasise for the student, I think we, we probably can't overemphasise how remarkable this period was politically. You have uh, millennia of 
of sort of stable monarchy, monarchy and then you have this fury period of like furious activity where this is overturned and a totally different kind of regime is implemented and Milton is a leading as you said a leading intellectual figure in amongst this culture this new republican protestant republican culture and it was already a t it was already a, re a revolution it was already a moment of mm. massive social change and massive mm. social instability and milton <clears throat> was not one of the more restrained voices if i can put it like yeah that. he is right out yeah. there calling for even more revolution yeah. Yeah. that it hasn't gone far enough yeah. um that we need to not just make a few changes to the way the church is struck but uproot the systems mm. of church government mm. for example um so he he was a very radical and very controversial figure mm. absolutely committed to the uh i was going to say the search for truth but that's not an accurate way of putting it more like the combat for truth mm. he believed that truth is something that you have to fight for publicly through yeah. not not necessarily through bloodshed, although he was open to the idea, for example, yeah. in, in the case of, of executing the ruler, the head of state, um, but that, that there is a combat for truth, right. a, a battle of ideas, and that righteousness is all about having, let's say, a, a, a vocation, a calling to participate in that combat, mm -hmm. to put your view, point of view out there, even if it's inconvenient to you personally, even if you put yourself at great risk by doing so. So that's Milton's formative mm. period. While working for Cromwell, he, he translated um, all of the new government's diplomatic texts into Latin. He was the secretary for foreign tongues, so he would translate documents for communication with the governments of France and Spain and the Netherlands and, and, and so on. Um, and Latin was the Latin was the shared, was the shared language, language. Yeah. and Milton was a great linguist, the greatest linguist of his day with mastery in um, ancient and modern mm. languages. He, he published works in multiple languages. He published poetry in multiple languages. It was while working for Cromwell, translating these, staying up late, translating documents into Latin. If you can imagine the amount of paperwork that a new system of government mm. would involve, Milton was was helping to churn out that paperwork and during that period he began to go blind and completely lost his sight um and he saw that as a kind of heroic mm -hmm. gift almost almost a self martyrdom he knew he was going blind but he kept on squinting over these mm -hmm. documents until his sight had gone not long afterwards the whole revolutionary project mm -hmm. collapsed mm -hmm. failed the monarchy was brought back most of Milton's friends and colleagues and collaborators were sent to prison. Some of them were executed. Milton himself was arrested and placed under house arrest, which is similar to being quarantined. Uh, <laughs> yeah. there, there are police who are going to lock you away if you're seen outside your house. And this was seen as a special favor. He was yeah. such a celebrity. He was such a celebrated public figure, um, such a large and animated and attractive combative personality uh, if you think of the kind of enemy who you would love to fight against even some of his enemies revered him um it was a special favor to him that he was placed under house arrest because he had after all already gone blind mm. he, he he was seen as a relatively defenseless figure he had powerful friends in the new government who helped to essentially saved his life mm. because he could have easily um been yeah. executed for crimes against the the state um was it his was it his artistic contribution that softened the blow no him, at not? this point he was still so by now milton is old he's, yeah. he's aging at this point he is still thought of as a political pamphleteer right. and a great a, a, one of the leading intellectual yeah. figures he, he was widely regarded as the most educated person of his age the greatest linguist, the greatest translator, the greatest prose writer. Mm. So although he was famous for his political views, his his prose itself, simply the the experience of reading him is so ennobling and mm. so captivating that he 
he was certainly a celebrated figure for his mastery of rhetoric for his for his style um and he was known to be a poet he had published poetry but he never would have been remembered primarily as a poet at this point the vast majority of what he had done was was political and religious prose um so it was more it was more personal friendships yeah. people who had gone over into the new government who seem to have pulled the strings mm. and convinced convinced the powers that be that this is a harmless person mm. house arrest is good enough just yeah. let him die he can't do anything else well he could do something else yeah. this yeah, sure old could. blind man at the point in his life in which everything he had ever believed in had failed every cause that he'd ever committed himself to had come to nothing his whole life's work had mm. turned out to be not just futile but um, worse than futile, he was he was constantly in danger. Although he was under house arrest, he felt that people were spying on him. That if he took a wrong turn, took a wrong step, you know, they they were they they were still watching him in an ominous way, mm. supervising his movements. So the thing he had devoted his life to, his country, he was a profoundly patriotic man he mm. believed that england was the new israel the people of god yeah. with a special elected by god with a special vocation among the nations to be a light of liberty a bit like the way the puritans who fled persecution yeah. yeah in milton's time the puritans who fled persecution went and founded america yes the way they talked about america and still talk about america to this day a a, a nation chosen by god a city on a hill a light for all the nations um a nation that has a a um uh you see what i, I yeah. mean a, a yeah. mission yeah which is far more than simply securing the safety of its own yeah. population milton understood england in that way now the phrase that was you that is used is a sort of elect nation yeah providentially elect yeah uh just like israel was elect so too is england so too is this new new world yeah. nation of the united states and yeah it's a peculiar mindset of it's a pecu it's peculiar to that age really in a lot of ways although it kind of extends in america to uh, to be come more of a kind of cultural mindset in america but it's definitely a, six, a 17th century peculiarity from what i understand historically it, it's speaking. a very <laughs> it's a very puritan thing yeah, it involves yeah. the particular way they read the bible yeah. um the puritans who are essentially 17th century english protestants who aren't anglicans that's yeah, yeah, that's, that's the right. easiest way to that's define right. puritans um john bunyan yeah. is another example of a puritan who also ended up writing his great works in prison yeah um uh one of the peculiarities of the puritans is that they really 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 were, were steeped in the world of the old testament they yes. were not essentially a new testament people they were old testament people even if you read the names that they name their yeah. children, they're yeah. all these fabulous. That's right, Jeremiah, Nehemiah. The, they, they have very, very, even very obscure Old Testament yeah. names, right? Like um, and Rehoboth and yeah, um, Ichabod and things like exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> and if you go to America and look at early towns that were part of the early Puritan settlement yeah. of America, they're named after Old Testament places in many cases as well. Yeah. Um, and something about that deep, deep Old Testament mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of material in the Old Testament about the nations, yeah. about the people of God as an elect nation, yeah. not just individual salvation, but a social, political, international kind mm. of mission. Um, and the Puritans were quite comfortable with allegorizing ways of yes, reading the old testament that's right so yeah. you put all that together yeah and it 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 was i'm not defending this reading of the old testament mm -hmm. but it was sort of normal yeah for example for, for someone like milton to see england as representing everything that <laughs> israel and jerusalem represent in yeah. the old testament and when england ceases to be faithful to its own vocation what happens Puritans bail and go to America yeah, and say, well, right. now this is the elect one. That's right. To hell with England. Or <laughs> um, yeah. well, not necessarily to hell with England, but England has has rejected its own destiny, its own election, mm. and we're going to take mm. we're, we're going to take God's mission elsewhere. Even by the 18th century, 
long time after Milton, 100 years or more after Milton, even then, William Blake, another great radical Christian poet, um, William Blake saw England as embodying everything that Jerusalem mm. represents right. in the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, it Blake's famous poem, which is actually called Milton, but part of it has been, it, mm. it is, it's one of the most loved choral pieces in, mm. in, um, England and did those feet in ancient time. Have you ever, oh, yeah, have you yeah. ever performed this one? No, I haven't or? performed it, but I know, I know it. Yeah. It's the unofficial English national yeah, yeah, that's anthem, right. basically. That's oh, a beautiful piece. It's um, wonderful. Did those feet in ancient time walk upon England's mountains yeah. green and was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pastures seen? And did that countenance divine shine forth upon those clouded hills? Mm. And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic mills? That's Blake's miltonic in a poem he wrote yeah. about milton he sees through the eyes of prophecy yeah and sees that the lamb of god who we know walked around in palestine jesus you understand yeah. <laughs> he says jesus walked upon england's yeah. mountains green his countenance shone upon this place and jerusalem the holy city mm. is no longer in palestine jerusalem now he says was built here Mm. among these dark satanic mills yeah. which for blake represent a kind of mix between industrialization mm. and the christian church the ang All right. yeah, yeah. anglicanism so here among these satanic buildings of cathedrals and factories the city of jerusalem was once built here. yeah yeah and then blake ends with a militant call again very much like milton i will not cease from mental fight nor shall my sword sleep in my hand Till we have built Jerusalem yeah. on England's green and pleasant land. It's a very, um, you, you see how that is a biblical way of talking. Yeah. And it's a very, very peculiar yeah, it is. way of allegorizing yeah. the meaning of the Old yeah. Testament yeah. to bring even the warlike dimensions of the Old Testament, yeah. to bring that down and say, this is a mental fight. We are fighting mm. for a spiritual Jerusalem, mm. a place of true liberty a place, um, uh, well, etc. So that's that's Blake channeling Milton. Yes. Here's the, here's the important point about Milton, though. Everything he had believed in has come to nothing. He's old and blind yeah. and alone in his house, and he got revenge on the whole world <laughs> by writing... Paradise Lost. The greatest poem of all time. Yeah, and that, and that's this is a great segue. But one, again, this is just to add to that segue. That there's this highly, it's a highly charged eschatological way of looking at things as well, isn't it? That the yeah. England is this elect nation. Um, Blake, the Blake poem that you've just quoted talks about we will build Jerusalem here. Yeah. There's an eschatological vision, a vision of the future, of yeah. the end. Um, and all that come, comes crumbling down for Milton in 1660. Yeah, he would just he might have seen it happening earlier, of course, because you can kind of look at what was happening in the late 1650s. And you can read his pamphlets, and even from the 1640s, he's raging against his <laughs> colleagues, saying, yes. you, "You timid, yeah. worthless! You, like rouse yourself, Get, yes. um, be strong, be courageous. Yeah. Yeah. Why are you so timid and half-hearted about everything you're?" Yeah. doing when Cromwell wanted to install Presbyterianism as the new Church of England an excellent idea yeah <laughs> uh, what could go wrong um M Milton railed against this and said new presbyter is but old, old priest, old priest yeah the idea that we take Anglican with all the problems that it's created by having an established church we uproot it and what do we do plant another church with a different name and <laughs> yeah, rename the priests right. You know, Milton was furious about this stuff, even in the 1640s. Yeah, yeah. Um, he thought a real reformation of England yeah. is going to have to be far more. We've got to uproot things and burn them mm -hmm. and start again. Yeah, so you have this highly, he's, he's, he's already seeing that it's, it's, it's a flawed project in the 1640s. It comes, this, this whole eschatological, this eschatologically driven ref, reformation or revolution, revolutionary project comes crumbling down in 1660. And Mill responds by writing Milton. a Milton. Sorry, not Mill. Mill's great too. Mill Milton. Uh, <laughs> Milton responds. In some sense, he responds by writing. Uh, uh, um, um, I just almost said the Divine Comedy. This shows me this head cold is doing not doing me very well. Paradise Lost, um, and Paradise Lost isn't actually about eschatology. It's not about England. 
it's actually about the Garden of Eden. Mm-hmm. And it's, it, in in the sense, it's a it's um it's a poem about it's a poem about so the the fall, and then it leads into a sort of soteriological poem which he writes afterwards, doesn't it? So. Mm-hmm. And the interesting thing about Paradise Lost, in one sense, yes, you go from a kind of political eschatology where yeah. you are trying to bring in God's That's kingdom right. through political and social reform. You go from that to a poem that is not about the end, but about <clears> the beginning. <throat> it goes right back to the beginning of creation. The whole the whole poem, which is a couple of hundred pages long, it's the, it's the size of a small novel. The whole poem is a retelling of Genesis 1 to 3, um, the creation of Adam and Eve, their temptation and fall, and their banishment from the garden. Mm. That's the whole. Um... You have to excuse my colleague. Sorry, I thought my phone was on silent. <laughs> um, <laughs> Mine will probably ring too open. Um, that's that's what the poem is yeah. about. But it is one of the most encyclopedic, yeah. comprehensive, all-encompassing works um, ever ever mm. written. Because, and in this way, it is like Dante's Divine Comedy, yeah. an encyclopedic work that contains within itself all of space yeah. and all of time. Yeah. It is about Genesis, it's about the beginning of the world. Yeah. In the last lines of the poem, Adam and Eve are exiting the garden. Yeah. But before that has happened, they have been given a prophetic vision. An angel Michael mm. comes and it unfolds to them the future destiny mm. of the world, mm. showing them the catastrophic chain of consequences that has been set in motion by the decision yeah and it leads right to the last judgment and the end of the world so the poem embraces within itself while focusing on three chapters of the bible it's the whole bible the whole vision of christian history basically everything from the start of the world to the end yeah Yeah. the furthest reaches of space and time it goes back before the creation of the world and you get to actually see the creation taking place um it's one of the things that it, that um, attracts many readers to this poem mm. is the sense of spatial vastness. Milton yeah. has a way yeah. of portraying the incredible vastness of creation um, of the universe. Yeah, now that's an important, that's an interesting point, isn't it? And it's illustrated here in um, book nine, which is the reading for this week over in... So if we're looking here on page 2788 in the ninth edition, or line 50, um, where it talks about how Satan travels to Earth and then he circles it a number of times to stay in the dark. Now, as I, as I, if you read the rest of the poem, you get more of a sense of the cosmology that's um, under sort of, I guess, that's underpinning uh, Milton's vision here. And it is a, it's actually a modern cosmology, which is what's fascinating mm. because the the new cosmology is really only just coming into vogue at this mm. point, and he he uses it as an artistic device, and it's and it is highly spatial and it's vast, and you really get that sense, don't you, throughout the whole poem? But it's illustrated particularly in those lines, I think. The only contemporary figure who is mentioned in the poem, the poem is full of characters from the Bible and full of characters from Greek and Roman mm. mythology. Um, and it has historical characters in it. But the mm. only person from Milton's own lifetime who is mentioned in the poem is Galileo. Yeah. Milton, during his travels to Italy as a young man, visited Galileo and w- w- must have been one of the first people to look through Galileo's telescope. And he, uh, the, the, that sense of, if, if, if you had always felt somehow, as you do intuitively, that the earth is kind of what there is, you walk around on the earth, it feels like it's central. Mm. Um, to look through a telescope and see stars, yeah. which might be other planets mm. far away, and to realize that from someone else's point of view, the Earth is a tiny, minuscule yeah, yeah. star. Milton carries that sense of the spatial hugeness. Yeah. It's the first work of, of literature that, that, and more than any other work, it, it, it has a science fiction quality in this uh, Satan travels through space yeah yeah it's very he, sci-fi yeah he absolutely. travels even towards space because the created universe is only one small thing that exists yeah so, outside it is this infinite chaos yeah so, and bigger than that is god and satan travels right. through them and that, that's right so he even travels through this chaos this sort of yeah. infinite darkness 
Uh, Which is get, not the creation. To get to the cosmos. <laughs> to get to the cosmos. So, so let, let me, let just be, just for the sake of time, yeah. um, we need to kind of quickly probably situate book nine yeah, in, the, yeah. in the wider poem. Now, at the, um, at the beginning of the um, poem, we meet, we, we uh, you, you'll be better at summarising this, but we actually meet, the, the, the key character is Satan. Yeah. He's the main character. I, that, and he's the, he is depicted actually at the beginning of the poem as a quite an epic an epic hero, isn't he? In fact, there's a moment just like Aeneas does in um, the reading that we did in um, the Aeneid the other day. There's a moment where Satan picks up the shield, this massive shield, mm. and puts on his shoulders. Mm. Um, so there's a, there's some interesting parallels there between a sort of more positive heroes, and here we have like an anti yeah. an anti hero or a type an anti hero type. Um, Satan's been thrown out of heaven. He's re he and the, the angels have. have well, like the place which we now know, you know, it's called hell. Um, they're bound there, and then they begin to develop. They they find themselves able to move. They begin to develop a plan of what to do next. They hold a parliament. They have a discussion about how what they can do to get back at at their creator, and it sort of works from there, doesn't it? Yeah, and and Satan's plan is essentially, look, we might. We've been roundly thrashed and defeated. <laughs> yes. um, we've proven that he really is the Almighty. We, we were close, but he, he, he's even stronger than us. Yeah. There's there's a fairly comedic kind of strain through the way Satan represents himself in those early books, which is the important balance to thinking of his. Yes, he has heroic qualities, but he also it is it is largely his own self-presentation yeah. that's very heroic. He depicts himself in a heroic way, but there are it, it, the things he says in those opening yeah. books are filled yeah. with comedy because yeah. his perspective is so distorted yeah. and so skewed. He, yeah. he imagines himself to be so much more significant than yeah. he really is and deliberately manipulates his own followers yeah, yeah. into... Um, uh, yeah, he, he, he's he's portrayed quite realistically, I guess, as a great leader and a great orator who is able to work the crowd in ways that yes. fit his own yes. peculiar and sometimes irrational designs. Yes. At any rate, his plan is, even if we can't ever really strike out again at God, if even if even if he's mm. too much too strong for us, maybe we can at least annoy him. Yes. So let's go explore this new creation that he's just made mm. and see if we can spoil it in some way and the interest it's a it's a vandalism type yeah, of motivation is, yeah. well let's just spray <laughs> god's made a new world let's let's see if we can spray paint it spray paint. <laughs> that's that's the motivation the motivation for so th there's a there are heavenly there's sort of scenes in the heavenly court and there's scenes in the the court of hell uh the scenes in the heavenly court uh depict a discussion of between the father and the son of how do we what what should we do? The question the question that they're rest, they're, they're wrestling with. If God wrestles within Himself, if you know, it, it's depicted very carefully in the poem. It's actually quite masterful how he, even how he he depicts um, the Father and the Son discussing things. But um, in the anthropomorphic, the inevitable anthropomorphisms that occur, there's a discussion. They're trying to work out what do we do to resolve this problem. We've lost a third of the people. Who are meant to be worshiping me right so like this is the, the angels the yeah. angels yeah the, the the angels are the fit that these these people these figures have disappeared they're meant to be here serving me things are not right i have an idea let's create a, a let's let's make up the numbers with a different race in with an, in a new creation we create a we create an, an, a whole an, uh we create create a new creation with a new um a new race which can make up the, the gap that's been left by these fallen mm. angels, right? That's the, yeah. that's it. And, and, and this is Milton. It's the reason you exist is you yes. think you're a re replacement of a fallen angel. Yeah, uh, it's an incredible thought. And uh, this is Milton, it seems to me anyway, seeking to justify the actions of God, right? He's trying to explain. Yeah. He's trying to explain reality. Yeah. And the poem, the po we perhaps should have said this earlier, but the poem begins by announcing its themes. Mm. He asks for the divine muse, the Holy Spirit, to inspire him that I may assert eternal providence and yes. justify the ways of God yes. to men. He he is thinking about the story of the Bible, 
where God makes a perfect creation, but it all goes wrong. Mm. He's thinking about his own experience of living through a pivotal moment of history, and he's realized history doesn't turn out right either. Mm. People don't, uh, e even where there is a kind of teleological destiny, mm. the human heart is so crooked that we ourselves will hijack history as it were. Mm. So the human race hasn't turned out right. History hasn't turned out right. Milton's own personal life hasn't turned out right mm. because the things he has worked for have come to nothing. And in in the in the that, those kind of overlapping narratives, his own life experience, particularly his descent into blindness, which he mm. takes very hard and writes about uh, in very moving ways over and over again mm. in different works. Um, his own personal narrative, the the narrative of England, um, and the narrative of the people of God in the in yeah. the Bible. These these are all kind of layered on top of each other, and Milton says, well. How could, if if there's a creator, yeah, how could all this be such a mess, mm. so intractably crooked and broken? Mm. Um, there is a creator. There is a providential order to history. There is a reason why God allows the fall to happen. Mm. There is a reason why God allows sin and suffering mm. and death into our world. Um, and Milton writes this poem to justify God's ways yeah. to show. Not necessarily to show that the universe has been set up in the way that we would prefer, mm -hmm. but it's been set up by a God who is wise and just. So the poem is is a kind of elaborate imaginative theodicy. Yes. Showing that um, it's an argument for providence. Yes. And it's an argument for the justice and goodness of God. And so in in uh, the books leading up to book nine, we have the creation, which is a wonderful the, the depiction of the creation is is tremendous mm -hmm. uh, uh adam and eve um begin their work in the garden satan comes to suss out what's going on he sees what's happening and the angels are aware that there's been a sort of a uh there's been an intrusion uh and so they, they're on their guard Raphael, who's a an angel comes down and rec recounts the uh the battles in heaven that have happened before the fact that there is the possibility of this uh this sort of sinister force that's going to intrude and so you know be it, 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 it takes a, a long time to, re, to retell this um and so when we get to book nine Raphael has just fin just left um just left and they have um uh and so now Adam and Eve are left to their own devices again and so this is where we are here yeah and the fall the actual act of eating the apple the fatal moment is uh, what, By the way, the fact that it's an apple is a Miltonian thing, right? It's not actually yeah. a biblical thing. Oh, there's many things that people <laughs> think are in Genesis, but they're in Milton. They're in Milton. <laughs> the <laughs> fact that it's an apple, yeah. the idea that Satan was once an angel yeah. of light who was a good angel who fell, that there are things that are Milton's embellishments of the biblical yeah. Yeah. account. Um, in some ways, you could describe the poem as filling in all the gaps that are in. Yeah, the that's exactly. I, I think that's he exactly. He takes right. those gaps and he he makes them enormous. Like he, they're they're big gaps. I mean, that's yeah. that's part of the nature of it, of this, the biblical text. That he tries to fill them in. Here's my favourite one from Book Nine, because Milton is is resolutely faithful to the biblical text. He yeah. reveres yeah, he the Bible. Yeah. He is. He will never he's not, change. He's not cavalier at all, is he? He he he's he's writing an account of a mm. biblical story, mm. and he is very very <clears> very strict in adhering to the biblical text but wherever it has a gap mm. he will just let his imagination soar so here's my favorite one from book nine um when you read the account in genesis there's a man and a woman in the garden mm. and the serpent is the most crafty creature and it comes up and starts talking to eve yes to persuade her to fall even the assumption by the way that the serpent is actually satan is not yes. ever stated in the biblical story um, Milton gives a whole account. He, he rationalizes the biblical story at every point. Mm. He shows how Satan deliberately incarnates himself into the form of a snake. Um, and then he gives an ex. He, here's the next thing he rationalizes. Surely if a snake came up and talked to you, the first thing you would say is, how can you talk? You're a snake. Yes. In the Bible, there's an amazing silence about this. Eve just starts conversing with the snake mm. as if it were a natural thing to do. Mm. Milton fills in that yeah gap yeah by saying uh do you like this part as well yeah i love it i love this invention where the serpent eve says 
<laughs> How come you can talk? Yeah, yeah, that's and great. the snake says, well, I was just slithering around doing my own thing. And then I saw this delicious looking fruit and I was really hungry. And as I bit into the fruit, suddenly my eyes were open. Oh, it's an incredible, uh, an incredible way of going, okay, how is Satan going to convince Eve to eat the fruit? Yeah. He, he, he invents this scenario where... And it's quite a compelling yeah, invention. Yeah, right? exactly. Very Because compelling. he doesn't tell her which fruit it is. He just says, I just like this fruit. It's transformed me. I was a beast and I'd been raised to your level. And I the, wonder if you ate this, what level you'd be yeah, raised Yeah, and this is the key thing, right, is that this role of uh, the attraction of reason Yeah, Eve is really powerful. Yeah. Uh, it's the knowledge of good and evil. That's what the tree is, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But actually for Milton, he, he, he says it's actually like this pursuit of reason. Yeah. In, in one way, the poem is about knowledge it's about the type that it, it's yeah, a poem it about is, education yeah. and learning and the huge amounts of knowledge that god is willing to share with his creatures and it's about the boundaries of what we can yeah. know there's there's good knowledge and there are bad ways of reaching too far going beyond what's proper yeah, yeah. um milton has derived this from the biblical account mm. itself of course um where the, the the fruit claims to offer knowledge it claims to offer wisdom mm. um or satan claims that that's that's what's on offer um ye shall be as gods knowing the difference between good and evil mm. um so the poem is about a knowledge that corrupts or a search for knowledge that that corrupts and destroys mm. um eve makes the fateful choice mm. yeah um she reaches out her hand <coughs> she plucks the fruit she eats it can i say i know i know we're running yeah. short on time yeah. can i can i say something about the the psychological yeah. depth with with which milton explores the temptation scene because i think that's one of the great legacies of paradise lost is the although it's a very artificial work of art in one way mm -hmm. it's written in the epic style of homer and virgil um it's not novelistic at all. It is. It has the ceremonial qualities of epic, where characters stand up and make ornate speeches to one another. It has the structure of epic, where you begin in the middle of the action and then move <clears throat> backwards and then cycle back to the climactic moment. Um, it for all its and and the language itself is ceremonial mm. and it has an artificial, elevated, grand rhetorical mm. um, flavor to it. In spite of all that, the psychological realism yeah. with which Milton scrutinizes his characters at the moment of decision. In fact, it's it's worth knowing all of Milton's major works are about that moment of temptation. Right. He wrote one about Samson. Right. He wrote one about Jesus being tempted by the devil. He wrote an earlier one about a lady being tempted to um, give up her chastity. Um, over and over again, Milton is interested in almost at, at the moment of temptation where you're just deciding mm. think of that split it's less than a split mm. second where your will turns yeah you were going to go this way and now you go that way yeah. he, he he kind of zooms in and hits the pause button yeah. and uses his uses his poetry to investigate the internal psychological processes that lead to that turning yeah yeah so i think that the most important thing really that's going on in book nine of Paradise Lost is a zooming in on the will and the the, the reason and the will of Eve mm. as she begins to shift. She's fallen before she ever eats the fruit, right? She's, yeah, yeah. The moment you decide to eat the fruit, you're already rebelling against God. Yeah. And the moment you want to decide to do that, you've already gone wrong in some way. So Milton is scrutinizing quite carefully and quite rigorously yeah. this process in which a perfect and innocent and blameless creature becomes twisted yes. to the point that she would want to do something that is openly defiant against God. Yeah. And then Adam comes in and Milton again zooms in on a Adam's yeah. inner life. Adam decides for reasons quite different from Eve. Yeah, so Eve decides because she wants to decide to eat the fruit because she wants to make herself like God. She wants to make her, she wants to get ahead of her husband. And this, this is motivation happening here as well. Um, she's deceived too. She's deceived into that. Yeah. She, she's deceived thinking the fruit has something wonderful to yeah, offer. Yeah. Adam eats it <clears throat> with no, with clear eyed knowledge that this is suicide. Adam yeah. essentially commits suicide yeah. saying, look, I'd rather 
rather die than and be with you. Die with you than be yeah. alone without you. Yeah. So their reasons, their motivations, their their, their reasonings yeah. are very, very different. <clears throat> mm. And in each case, Milton explores that inner transformation. Yes. And then explores the outer effects of that, the way their idyllic, beautiful yes. love collapses into this self-possessive, grasping yes. lust. Yes. The way their harmony, and you have to read earlier parts of the poem to fully see these contrasts, but their harmonious kind of calibration with the rhythms and <clears> harmonies <throat> of creation um, collapse into this profoundly disordered mm. when you read Eve's speeches about God as our great forbidder safe with all yeah. his spies about yeah. him um, and she begins worshipping the tree instead of the yeah it's extraordinary creator. when she like, worships she the becomes tree. a pagan that's yeah, the first exactly. thing that happens to her um, and Adam <clears throat> when when they later on begin talking about what to do they start mm. working out a, a kind of suicide pact let's just finish ourselves mm. off so the so Milton zooms in on the moment of temptation, which he's tremendously fascinated mm. with. And in some of his stories, in some of his great works, the character stands firm and you get to see a, a psychological right. analysis of what standing firm looks like. And in some of them, his characters fall and yeah. you get to see a psychological analysis of what falling is. It's always something that happens within you. Yeah. It's a very individual thing. It's a very... Um, uh, it's an invisible process mm. whereby the will turns. Um, but then there are the outward effects. Yeah, the of results this, can you, be corporate or they can be universal. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, they're universal. Yeah. It's, it's why Paradise Lost, and maybe we could end with this, mm. um, with, with this um, observation, it's why Paradise Lost is not just a kind of mythic story about yeah. our first ancestors long ago. It's a story about Milton's blindness mm. and his disappointments. It's a story about England's foolishness and hardness of heart. Mm. It's a story about why our world is in the trouble yeah. that it's in. It's a story about why no human project, no human work in this world will ever actually live up to its own yeah. promise. Yeah. Um, in our own time, <clears throat> in just recent weeks and months, we've witnessed the extraordinary fragility of yeah. entire kind of civilizational orders that we assume to be very stable and permanent. Yeah. Yeah. And one small thing happens in one place in the world and you begin to see that everything can come down yeah. like a house of yep. cards. Um, it's Paradise Lost is about that. It's about the vulnerability and fragility and um, unfinishedness of, mm. of every human project yeah, yeah. Bec because of the chain of consequences universal consequences that are set in motion yeah. by what by the turning of the will yeah it's in this respect that milton is a deeply augustinian and deeply christian thinker he does not believe that evil resides primarily in like social structures or no, that's right. even in evil demonic powers that are out there um the human will is the most essential, most powerful, most momentous mm. thing in creation. Yeah. And the turning of the will, this way or that, the, 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 our inner disposition at the moment of temptation yeah. is the most important thing that ever happens to us. That's Milton's legacy, to, mm. to, 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 to give us that point of orientation, not just as a way of thinking about human psychology, but as a way of thinking about history mm. and institutions and our own destiny as people no, that's that's it's great and it's a great reading um we, we, we will finish there but i thought just to close it'd be worth just positing a few things that students can uh think about and maybe we can discuss in the forums online one, one of them being at what point does the fall begin uh is it earlier is it's hinted at i think earlier when eve starts to ask adam about whether they should work together today or separately uh is that the beginning where the cracks start to appear um, this is a deb hotly debated topic in Milton scholarship, I understand. Um, it'd be interesting to talk about the way that Milton uses language, particularly when, when the serpent is speaking, when Satan's speaking through the serpent, you have this uh, 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 use of the letter S as a, sort of as a strong uh, S sound in his speeches. 
uh, this hissing sound, which I think is really effective. And so we, we analyze the language in that regard, as well as when Eve starts to adopt Satan's way, a way of talking as well after she's eaten the fruit. I gave an <clears> example <throat> of that just before. Yeah. Yeah. The, describing God as our great forbidder, yes. safe with all his spies <laughs> about exactly. him. Uh, exactly. She sounds yeah. like Satan after yeah. she's eaten the fruit. It's, a, it's, it's terrifying. A, it's chilling. Yeah, and so it's a, that, that's a, a fascinating literary technique that people could, could think about as they're reading it as well. But also how Adam and Eve respond, the uh, the the way in which they deeply regret what they've done as well. So there's this um, sort of embrace of their of their sin, but then also this deep regret that occurs as well at the end of the book too. So there are some, there are lots of rich themes that could be explored, but we do need to leave it there. So uh, thanks for the chat uh, again, and, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, son.